Ian Connell, what's up? Good morning. Hey, Derek. How's it going? It's going great. Thank you for joining this uh, episode of the live production of the Data Binge podcast. This is going to be super fun, and this is our second time actually recording this, so it should be way better than the first one. <laughs> We're yeah, kinda, excited. Kinda win. Oh, excited to be here for round two of it. Yeah, yeah, kind of at the whim of, of technology, so to speak. So uh, just quickly, how we know each other. We're going to have a pretty fascinating discussion today about how you're working and leading some strategies with your current uh, organization to reimagine the K-12 through education experience. But just to, to turn back the, the hand of time for just a bit, how we know each other, we're actually pretty great friends. I would, I would like to call us best friends. And going back into where we knew each other, we both went to the University of California in Irvine, just kind of down the, down the road from me currently. And I was coming out of the financial aid department and I looked over and I heard someone call my name and it was you. We, we knew each other. We kind of ran each other, into each other on Ring Road in the university and at the gym. And you were doing a bus pooling con uh, competition. <laughs> you had this massive rope and all these. You were an athlete on the track team. So all your athlete friends and colleagues were out there. And you guys were pulling this bus. And then you invited me to join you. And then I, I joined you. And I think uh, the rest of, is, is history. Oh man, I, I uh, totally forgot about that story, but yes, <laughs> the bus pool, always a good way to meet friends, yeah. Yeah, and then later, as we knew each other uh, in, our, in, our, in our youth, if you want to call it that, we ran into, into each other at the gym again, and you were talking to me in the middle of doing these curls in front of the mirror at the gym, you started talking to me about this program, Management Leadership for Tomorrow. And you were super pumped up and excited about this new experience, this new educational experience you were embarking on. You were talking about getting your MBA, it, just some massive dreams. And I, I wasn't there yet. I was a couple years behind you. But that very discussion in that gym that day completely changed my life. Absolutely. It's why I'm here at Microsoft. It's why I was able to get my MBA and go to a full-time program. I'd love for you to tell folks about what management leadership for tomorrow is and what it did for you. Yeah. Um, well, first thing, it fundamentally changed the you know course and trajectory of my life, career, you know everything. I could say one hundred percent, I would not be doing what I'm doing today, where I'm at today, have the opportunities I have if it wasn't for the program. So, uh, so grateful for the program. Um, yeah, the quick, the quick, just kind of summary. It's a nonprofit that helps to through a series of, of different programs, but helps to build a diverse pipeline of uh, business leaders for tomorrow. So they're trying to attack the you know challenge of when you look at you know a third of the uh, population is Black, Latinx, or Native American, and only about less than five percent of C-suite or senior leadership at Fortune 500 companies are. So uh, they have a number of different programs that help to tackle that on different ways. Um, the program I was involved in is the MBA prep program. So it's specifically a fellowship program uh, about 18 months in duration, if I recall correctly, but to help folks to prepare, apply, and, and get into top business schools uh, across the country. So it's a heavy dose of one-on-one -on -one coaching model, um, heavy dose of um, um, I would say uh, cohort-based um, experiences where there's big uh, seminars that we bring all folks together over that time frame, and really, I mean, for me, the the big thing was just I would say probably two things for the program. But um, one, it just really helps to clarify what is the bar of excellence that is required to not only get in but like succeed in in these programs. And also creates the community group and kind of community of practice of other like-minded folks that are going through it too um, at the same time. Um, and then second, I think just opens doors with connections and and um, internships and other things that just you know changed changed my whole outlook on on what is possible. And uh, I can't I can't rave enough about it. And the reason why I think this is so fascinating, especially right now during this current time of social unrest and you have educational paradigms that are changing because of COVID. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, not only in K through 12, but all after that, as folks go into university or, or don't go into university and go into vacation. 
But when you think about 33% of the country, to your point, being uh, Latino descent, Native American, African American, 33%, but only 5% are represented at Fortune 500 companies in, in some kind of uh, executive presence, that's a, that's a massive disparity. So for me, with you even just talking word of mouth to me about the program a couple years ahead of me, I saw you uh, work very hard, take your GMAT, get into to Booth at the University of Chicago, which was uh, number one uh, uh, school of management MBA program in the world year over year constantly. I don't know what it is today, but for you to come from you know a, a pretty humble background like you did and get to the place where you're at today, likewise for me to kind of follow in your footsteps through this program, get one-on-one -on -one coaching and just completely open up the trajectory of our academic lives and our, our career lives, it's, it's pretty fundamental and pretty powerful in what programming can do for folks uh, in, in education and in, in terms of changing their lives. So uh, a big call out to Coach Kendra. I know she's going to check this out. She was my coach uh, in, the, in the MBA prep program for MLT. She was just fundamental in getting me into uh, UTOS in the Macomb School of Business. So she was just so helpful for me. I know she was helpful for you too. Yeah, Kendra is my coach as well. So Kendra, if you hear this, you're changing lives, so keep it up. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the one thing I, I, I've shared this story with you before, but I think it's, I think it's a, a funny story just like of how going through the experience and, and everyone has different starting points when they're entering MLT, but just from my specific like starting point of how it, it just thrusts you into these new experiences that you might not have uh, access to or just be familiar with like uh, before going into the MBA program. So, um, and it, uh, funny first story. So my first uh, exposure to MLT, didn't really know what it was about. I got referred by another colleague of ours, Jacob Bentley. Um, and the first kind of kickoff seminar was at the University of Virginia, uh, Darden School of Business. Um, and, uh, you know, they, they said, everyone has to fly there. This is a big, like, kickoff seminar. So uh, for me, I mean, believe it or not, that, that was maybe the third time I'd ever been on an airplane in my life. Like, partly uh, economic reasons, you know, uh, growing up and just other, other things. So had no luggage, like, not a, you know, traveler that's like familiar with all this stuff. Um, not sure what, you know, uh, what to wear, all these different things. So I'm, I'm like sure. stressing out, go to, go to, go to my mom and say, Hey, I, I like need to get a suitcase. And I, you know, I need to, to kind of figure this out. She, she, uh, lends me what still to this day is likely the largest suitcase I've ever seen in my entire life. Um, and I fill it with like, you know, so many different clothes because I wanted to make sure whatever the, you know, I was, you know, in the right attire for the different um, events and things like that. So I lug this thing, go across the country. I'm all nervous because of like, you know, haven't really traveled much. I'm going to check in at the hotel. And there's a bunch of other folks that are also checking in for the same, same event. And, uh, and I'm chatting with, uh, with another individual. He's checking in as well. And then, you know, he, he looks down and he sees this, you know, huge suitcase that uh, looks like I'm going on a European, you know, three month vacation uh, still has on from when, I guess, prior time that, you know, my mom had traveled like a, a bow or something that, to identify it, you know, cause it's a black suitcase and he's just like, Red kind of and, and it's like, you don't travel much, do you? And, uh, at first I didn't know, you know, kind of what he was referencing. And then I like look down and I see, you know, this got a big beat up suitcase and his suitcase that looks all sleek, you know, some kind of, you know, Samsonite or whatever the cool thing was though. And, um, uh, and I was, I was, you know, just made up something like, oh, what? Uh, yeah, you know, I, this was different suitcase. Wanted to make sure I had enough clothes. I'm going somewhere after I like, you know, kind of BS my way through it. Course, but, yeah, um, of course he did. But I mean, it was just funny. I mean, it's just like, that's just the start of an experience. And it came back and my mind was like literally expanded in a way that it could never go back of just what's possible, what all these folks are doing. And it was just outside of the realm of um, my social circle at the time of just what, you know, people were striving to achieve. I think prior to attending, M you know, the MLT seminar, I knew actually zero people who even had an MBA, not even like from a top tier school, like just like in general and MBA. Um, so it was just a life changing experience for me. And, and I know everyone has their own personal kind of stories with it, but um, can't, can't, uh, can't rave enough about it. Shout out coach Kendra. 
John Rice, you're doing great things, man. So, and I love that. And I'll go ahead and I'll, I'll link Management Leadership for Tomorrow's company, uh, LinkedIn company page along with some resources in the chat. Because I, I just think it's very important. And we're going to be talking about things like uh, low-income student populations. We're going to be talking about learning models, technology, a lot of different things on this discussion today. So can you talk, elaborate, and I, I know just from being friends with you, your, your, your mother's an educator. Um, when it comes to education, going to this top business school in Chicago, this kind of being a new situation for you, you could have had any job that you wanted. I know you were entertaining venture capital for a while. You were entertaining big tech for a while. How and why did you land in the industry you're in now? And maybe you could paint a picture of what uh, Charter Schools Growth Fund is as well. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll start there just to kind of go back to how I got here. So I'm um, at Charter School Growth Fund. So we're a nonprofit that helps to identify the best charter schools across the country uh, and help um, fund their expansion and, and increase their impact. So uh, help them to serve more students. So a good example is if I have a very um, awesome charter school doing great things for kids and I have a single school and I'd, I'd like to open three more of those schools and, and serve, um, serve those additional families, we would actually help to support that through grants and um, primarily through grants to help help um, launch those schools. Because like any organization, when you're growing, you need to have funding to help fund that growth to, to do it well. Um, so I'm on the investment team. So I, I spend my time uh, in schools, hanging out with school leaders and just really uh, learning about what their vision is for, um, for their school and what they'd like to ultimately achieve for students and see if it makes sense to partner if, um, and to see if we can you know, help them get there with grant dollars. So um, within that, um, I also specialize in um, specifically in innovative schools. So there's a subset of our total um, dollars that are focused on schools that are really reimagining what the K-12 experience looks like. So, um, so that's where I spend a lot of time. So specifically helping to find and support um, really those school leaders that are, are trying to fundamentally solve some real challenging problems um, that they see in education and that they are passionate about um, and doing that in, in novel ways. So just to put like, you know, numbers on it uh, for me and the strategy overall is kind of a distributed strategy across across all of our uh, team members, but um, that I lead, um, usually try to commit anywhere from five to, you know, $8 million in uh, grants a year to, to help new schools launch. And with the end goal of the current phase of the strategy is to help create um, 60,000 new seats. So we use seats as a unit of measure just because schools if you use schools as a unit measure, it, it varies because some schools might have 500 students, they might have 300 students. But um, if you think of like an average of, you know, maybe 400 kids or so uh, a school, it's about 150 schools across the, the strategy and we're about 75% of the way through that. So, so that's what I do. How I got here, um, as you mentioned, um, was in the home of the educator. Mother was, uh, you know, 20 year plus educator uh, focused on elementary. So had that as the backdrop of just seeing uh, her passion for education, seeing the just um, how hard teachers work. I mean, it, it, is, it is not an easy job and just how mission driven they are. And that was kind of like in the back of my mind, just knowing that and experiencing that um, growing up. Um, and uh, like in, in hindsight, it looks like there's a you know, kind of straight through line connection of how I got here, but it's, it was really more of a, a random walk. And there were some critical, I would say, points along the way that, that um, shifted my path here. But um, started my career, helped to co-found a, a technology company called Launchpad. It um, offers technology to state and local government to help manage their government programs, uh, social programs, workforce development, economic development programs. And just um, through that, at the time, we were our first initial kind of like wedge in was focusing on workforce development programs. So focusing on individuals that um, are out of the workforce and uh, needing retraining uh, to re-enter the workforce. Um, and what was the common thread of all of the folks that we, that we were creating the software to help to manage the programs for 
um, was most of them had pretty bad experiences with K-12 education and um, that just didn't set them up for success for the American dream of like economic mobility, all these things. So that kind of sat, sat um, you know, didn't sit right with me. And I was really trying to think about how could I become more involved? Um, I initially thought, hey, if I actually, my, you know, one of my guiding kind of life philosophies is I want to try to leave this earth with uh, leaving as much of a positive impact as I can. Um, so when I look at kind of the, you know, what, what is the, uh, you know, the list of, of things that I did in my life, I want that to be kind of the top of it. And I thought through that, um, through that kind of like internal thought process of how can I do that? I thought being in some type of support role or investing role where I'm able to help others with great ideas to, to, to do those ideas. And, and, um, that actually is the, the way to have the best in, impact. Um, I took it a step further and I was thinking, actually, if I help others that are building tools to serve, um, schools, that would be the best. So like maybe focusing on venture capital and ed tech through that, um, you know, uh, I thought that would be highest leverage point. Also realized I knew nothing about investing, nothing about, you know, venture it was just kind of like a dream. And then, uh, was trying to figure out how to get there and then found MLT and they helped to kind of guide my path there. But so, um, I know this is a long way to, to talk about it, but I think it is important because, um, there are these, like, I see, think kind of like marquee moments in people's, um, careers that just change trajectories. And I, and I remember I was thinking about different paths forward and I was in, um, business school. I was, had done, uh, kind of the traditional for-profit venture kind of path of, of working at, uh, a couple funds there. And then I attended this uh, Chicago ideas week, which is essentially like a Ted talk week long event focused on just ideas, uh, uh, uh mainly, uh, social causes, but kind of a lot of like, you know, uh, bleeding edge, uh, topics and attended one. And, and, um, I wish I remember the individual's name, but, um, he was just talking about his education experience, um, and, um, just how, how different his personal path was and from some of the other, um, his other friends that were in his neighborhood due, due to some options that him and his family were able to exercise that, uh, others could not. And, um, and he really, uh, was going and referencing, um, things like Khan Academy and Sal Khan's work. And that took me down a rabbit hole to just learn more about it. And I just was, uh, I mean, like, I was like, this is it. I need to really focus on education be really close to where the action is. And, um, was lucky enough to connect with, with where I am now and through an alumni and found my way to the team here. But um, it's been a, it's been an interesting journey, but now I've been here six years and, and I'm loving it. When, and when you have discussion, and I know this because a lot of the people in my family are educators as well. When you have a discussion and the word charter comes up and you're talking about schools, there's a lot of contention there. And I think in this discussion, we're not going to talk about, the differences in the opinion of what you know, traditional public or charter schools mean and the, the capacities and the capabilities that they're giving students. But could you describe what a charter school is and maybe just lightly touch upon why you have the ability to do something different um, with the way that charter schools work? Yeah. So, I mean, the easiest way that I explain uh, to some friends that are not as familiar um, with charter schools, it's just public school, uh, all the same, you know, public funding, open enrollment, state accountability, but with a different governance structure. So um, typically managed by a nonprofit, have an independent board and independent management, which actually just allows for flexibility of decision making locally to that organization. So good example of that is if I wanted to start a charter school and I believed one of the big challenges maybe I was going to uh, try to tackle was closer connection to workforce and what are the workforce demands of, of, um, of tomorrow. And I thought one path there was to really focus on maybe computational thinking or computer science. And I wanted to design my day around that. And, um, and maybe some design components involve, um, you know, double or triple blocking exposure to, these topics, integrating a new curriculum, starting at maybe a little different time, ending at a different time, 
using some other flexibility of uh, staffing to do that. All those decisions, I have the autonomy to, to make those. Ultimately, I still have to you know, reach the same accountability goals as every other um, public school, but, um, but really I have the autonomy to make those decisions and have um, the flexibility to, to do that. And um, I mean, the, the, and for a lot of, I know your listeners, they're not as familiar with education, but from, if you think of maybe a private sector analogy uh, for, for most of your kind of audience, um, it really is like, if you just think about um, why new organizations, let's say startups are sometimes more effective at tackling challenges than the hundred plus year old company that's trying to, to, to do that. And, um, and really it's because there's a lot of just organizational inertia that happens when things are, um, you know, have been around for a long time. There's a lot of systems in place that were designed and doing great things, but it's hard to, to move the, you know, the big cruise ship, uh, very fast in new directions. And, um, which is why in a lot of big companies, they'll either, you know, there'll be startups that they help to support, or they might create like a little offshoot. That's like a innovation arm of the company and big districts do that too. And, and, and that's an awesome strategy as well, where they might have innovation zones or they basically give what they call charter like autonomies, but it's just more autonomous kind of schools or areas where they could try to innovate. So there's different ways to do it. Just charters is a way to focus on um, innovation. So I think that's the, that's the big piece. Cause if you think of, you know, if you look at the um, overall, if you take a huge step back, I mean, there, there are great things happening in every community in, in every school you could find um, like awesomeness in classrooms, awesomeness in like individuals, all that. But if you look back at the big system uh, and you look at the education outcomes, essentially if you draw like a, you know, regression, you, there's extremely high correlation with doing well academically and, and, being from high economic status. And, um, and we know that folks that are just so happen to be privileged to be born to higher economic status are not um, naturally more gifted or, or, or able to, you know, or smarter. It's just uh, there are many other things that contribute to that. Um, and if you look at from a big kind of like, take a step back and look, if this is what the system currently creates, um, means that we got to change some stuff and we got to fix some stuff. And it's, you know, my personal belief that in order to do that, you need flexibility because the system produces the outcomes that they were designed to produce. And and that's, and that's how, um, and that's kind of what we're getting now. So when you look at, let's take a step back and say, we need to kind of be, be flexible and think about different ways to solve these problems, especially as um, all, everything is so dynamic. Things are moving so fast in society now that, that the, the idea of needing to, be able to be responsive to community needs, responsive to student needs, and responsive to um, all the other changing kind of economic environments um, that are impacting all students and families. Like, I think flexibility is the key to be able to do that. And what this makes me think of, Ian, it's very interesting to me just because of what I'm doing in my career with data and AI. I'm helping businesses leverage the power of their data state who do some really great things within their customer base, with their employee base and and the visions of their businesses. And because you can do that with that data, you have those capabilities or you you can inject technology or frameworks into the current state of that business to really change things. But the bigger that organization is, you back to your point with this organizational uh, inertia, I've never heard of that, heard of that phrase that way, but it, it it just makes perfect sense to me. And when I think about autonomy and just going back to what some of the things you're thinking, I, I remember Matthew Walker, he wrote this book, he's a PhD, he wrote this book on why we sleep. And I think I, I heard uh, Peter Atia on his podcast, he interviewed him in like a three segment piece, like an hour each, just a lot of data. And, and just a, a simple little data point out of that, he mentioned, Matthew Walker mentioned, maybe we should adjust schools because new data or the timing that students actually go to, go into school because new data is saying that adolescent teenagers, maybe in, in pre junior high or high school, their circadian, their circadian rhythm is different than an adult or a young child. So they actually need to go to bed around midnight and wake up at, at 10 a.m. 
and and just the whole cultural dynamic of getting a school to start later. And just that little data point made me think, what else is embedded in our current educational system that we just don't have the liberty or the time or the flexibility to change or model for a better outcome? Um, so those are some of the things that I'm thinking about. Um, so can you think, can you just talk through what are some trends that are emerging? I know you're leading this innovation strategy for all these different schools, a pretty sizable fund in your hands and your team's hands for how you're allocating these funds towards these schools. What are some things that are coming up that are emer that are making you think um, pretty broadly about innovation and technology? Yeah. Well, I, I'll uh, rewind the clock and go back to kind of when we first launched this strategy. So we launched this in 2010. Uh, so prior to, I arrived in 2014. So this is a strategy that began before I came. But um, initially when we launched strategy, technology was very much like at the center of what the strategy is. And it was very much technology and how can we use technology to personalize education? So, um, and the way for, for folks to just think about what does it mean to personalize education? There's a, a phrase that a lot of folks in education uh, talk about um, uh, that there's a difference between teaching fifth grade math or teaching fifth graders math. So you could teach fifth grade math, which is what is the actual content you're supposed to teach for that grade as mapped out by maybe you know your state or difference of teaching fifth graders math. So, so there's a huge span of actually knowledge and where folks are coming in at, like where kiddos are coming in at. And there's even a recent study um, out of Texas A&M in conjunction with um, Duke and University of Wisconsin, where they uh, studied like 400,000 students across 10 states in fifth grade. And they came uh, to the conclusion that in the average fifth grade class room, there is about a seven grade span of students uh, knowledge in math. So, uh, so about a third of the um, students are two grades behind. A third are one grade behind. There's about like uh, a fourth that's on grade level and the last, I guess, 10% of my math right is uh, above grade level. So if you think of that, you're a fifth grade teacher. Everyone is at such different spots. You got, you know, 30 kids, let's just say on average 30 kids, one adult. What are you going to do, right? Like how can you meet the demands of everyone. So what you're likely going to do is teach right to the middle. So you're going to leave uh, that third of students that are two grades behind. That's going to be probably hard to access that information because there's, there's fundamental gaps, especially in math. It's a cumulative subject. There's going to be gaps to access it. Then you're going to leave the folks that are in the top, you know, uh, 10%. They're going to be bored, right? So, so there's just essentially half the class is not, um, it's not getting value from the time teaching. So it's like, how do you do that? As I mentioned, mother is a teacher. The the solution is not just work more, right? <laughs> like how do how do you uh, they work hard enough? Like how do you how do you solve that? So the idea was how can we use technology to solve that? And um, and um, so that that was like the initial on ramp. Um, and I think now, if you think fast forward ten years later from when we first started, there's actually pretty pretty well adopted ways of trying to to solve that problem. And, and many folks either call it like a centers model or a rotation model, but it's essentially breaking students into smaller groups to effectively reduce the student to teacher ratio and then creating differentiated tasks for the other students to work on while you're able to have like one-on-one -on -one time with the smaller group of students. So uh, you know, one group of students might be working on computers and using software to help uh, to meet them where they are and, and close gaps in their math understanding. So some gamified software or different things like that. Um, they might be watching Khan Academy videos. They might be doing other things. And then, so they're getting what they need where they're at. And then a teacher can work with the other group of students to give them more targeted um, feedback and instruction. And then you could pull data from that, from the online learning platforms. You could pull data from your, you know, ob observe data of, of the students you're, you know, working with. And then you could regroup those students. Maybe, you know, you could do it every day. You could do it every week, but you could regroup and, and get them what they need. So, so that, um, that is pretty, um, I would say pretty ubiquitous across, like if you go into an elementary school, many of them will do this, some version of this model. So, um, so I think from, uh, so go back from 2010 to, to, uh, to now, there's been a lot of progress there. 
So um, when I came on board and just in conjunction with the team, we were, you know, thinking about, you know, what, what else can we go beyond just this idea of like technology at the center and personalization and really where we, where we have settled on in the last couple of years is, is really broadening it. So technology is not at the center. Technology is a tool, an amplification tool of what already exists um, in the classroom, but it's, it's really in the, in the, in the background. And we still support things that are, um, you know, to increase personalization and different ways to do it, but we've expanded it for folks that are interested in tackling other problems. So we've opened up the um, kind of the range of stuff we'll support, but we really now focus on kind of two guiding questions. One, whatever the school or school leader or network of schools, whatever is their chosen area of innovation, is it central to the design of the school? So we really want it to be the center of, of what they're trying to solve. Not like I want to tackle this thing uh, to my prior example of starting a school. I want to tackle workforce development, like exposure to computational thinking. I'm going to do that for one hour every two weeks on Friday. Like that's not centered to the school design. It's a kind of like, you know, an, a bolt on. So is it, is it centered to, this, to the school design? And then the second big question is if successful, can the school act as a proof point nationally to other charters, to other districts to help spread that innovation? So when you were thinking about, so you're, you're adding this component of scale, you're adding this central strategy where obviously you guys have a strategy in how you allocate your funds and how you support these different schools but you're really looking for this outcome-based model, it sounds like, so that you can then take those winning outcomes and then apply them broadly across the rest of the portfolio of charter schools that you guys support. What are some technologies, and, and, and just briefly, I, I think, uh, and we've talked about this before, but in doing some research in what exactly is, is technology at schools and if it was someone were to ask me, I would say, oh, it's devices, it's tablets. It's so student-based. Um, but I, and I pulled this framework from Microsoft's K-12 uh, transformation literature, and they broke it up into these four different buckets. And this was completely new information for me, but it was leadership and policy. So how are you monitoring education um, holistically? How are you providing accessibility, partnerships with uh, organizations like yourselves, other nonprofits? modern teaching. So how are you developing educators? How are you assessing both the educator and the student constantly? How are you providing more immersive experiences? Uh, I know that, uh, I know about that just by visiting a Montessori recently that for my children. They had these immersive experiences where everything was broken up in stations to build this independence into this into the student. Um, I have some opinions on that, but and then there's intelligent environments. So how do you sustainably design environments? How do you secure these environments so that our, our kids are safe. And then finally, it comes down to this technology blueprint. And I think for the most part, most folks focus on the technology blueprint, operations, IT, whether they're using G Suite or Office or whatever software they're using to, to extend their capabilities. Folks are really focused on the, the devices, the data. What other things are important? Because I know you're thinking really, really strategically about this. What other things are important for you when it comes to technology and the capabilities that are trying to come from that? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I if you force, I'll force technologies into two broad buckets for a school. And um, so one is a kind of like related to the school model design. So a lot of the things you're talking about. Um, and the other is, I would say, operations and everything else, like administration, like the running of a uh, school. So when you, when you look at the um, school model design for the schools that I've been working with, there's probably three like mega trends that um, different technologies are working to support. So one is on personalization, which I which we talked about. Um, the second is around uh, project based and experiential learning. So how how are kids getting real hands on uh, experiences? showing what they know and, and being able to do that in a rigorous way. Uh, and the third is focusing on the whole child. Like, so there's a term that many educators are using social emotional learning. So it's really like focusing on, on what is outside of just, can I do math and read? Like 
how do I just know who I am as a person, my identity work, like how do I interact with others, all those other things that are like really important as a human, just to be an awesome human in society. But we know that those things are insanely important um, in school. So within those three things, we see a lot of technologies that are helping to um, support that. Um, and I could maybe I could maybe talk about like two there, and then I'll go to the the other the other um, the other buckets of operations and everything else. But um, I mean, there's uh, so for personalization, there's things as I mentioned before. There are programs like Dreambox Learning or ST Math, things that are really helping to meet students where they are in a online learning platform way. So so you are uh, a kiddo, you're on there, you're playing what would appear to be some uh, essentially like a, a video game esque type uh, user experience, and through that you're solving problems and um, and through that, the actual software is identifying, hey, you might have a conceptual gap here. Though you are supposed to be learning uh, some, you know, some concept in algebra, you, you, you actually need some more work on, you know, some basic fractions or things like that that are, are uh, actually really needed for that. So it could actually take you back and incorporate some of that in real time. So it helps to kind of scaffold that up, up for you. Um, so that's one way technology works. That's probably the one that has the longest history of uh, being in schools, like a, some type of platform like that. We're seeing new things that are pretty interesting. Like there's a, there's a company called Paper that was previously called Grade Slam um, that helps to, um, because now there's like the underlying thing of there are devices in schools, like so students can have access to devices. Um, instead of using only software to do that, how are they using a platform to um, match them with live tutors that are, are coming in and there's a hub of live, tu live tutors, you know, thousand miles away that then are, are actually being matched with students to um, help support them on what they need when they need it. So still using the, the you know, same computer software, but I mean, uh, doing real time matching with live people because we know whatever the software, how, however good software is, there's so many other things that being live um, and supporting uh, person to person, all those things that you pick up on that are really hard to um, to just kind of quantify. So uh, so matching live tutoring and in-person support, which is really awesome, especially if, if you're thinking about folks with, um, you know, experiencing budget cuts coming up and things like that. So I think that's an awesome thing. Um, on the social emotional side, there's um, there's an interesting company called SEL Lab that has a number of different tools, but um, just like quick assessments of students to identify where kind of they are on their social emotional journey and reading emotions, um, you know, being able to identify different types of, um, you know, behaviors in folks. And uh, so they, they have some, some quick quizzes primarily at the elementary level just to see, you know, how, how students are progressing there. And they also have some interesting, um, some interesting assessments where it helps schools to identify um, connectivity between students. So if you think of, uh, they could map out like a node network of all the students in your class, and you could see the students that have a strong relationship with other students. And you might be able to actually identify through that. You're like, hey, these two students actually don't have a lot of strong connections, or they haven't said that they have strong connections. And so we need to work on that over the year to get them more opportunities to interact with their classmates, interact with their teachers, to try to map that. So it's like a social graph, but within the classroom. So it's, it's pretty interesting. Um, so there's a lot of stuff on, on that side. Um, um, oh, sorry, did you want to ask something? No, I, I, no oh. please continue. I, yeah. Um, so the, uh, and then the, the last thing, I'll just go back to the operations side, which I think is, is really where a lot of like this frontier kind of like um, deep tech is helping with school. So if you think of all the stuff like transportation, communication, um, uh, all, all this stuff of just kind of like running of a school, there, there's a lot of technologies that could get applied to that. So um, interesting example, this is like um, transportation, Boston Public Schools recently did a project with MIT where they uh, use machine learning to map out what is the optimal transportation routes for their buses. And they reduced uh, expenditure by like 20% and saved like $5 million with all the same resources, just optimizing routes of where students were and, and things like that. So that's 5 million of found dollars that could be reinvested in children's education, but just applying a data layer on top of that. Um, there's an interesting company, Everyday Labs, which is actually focused on chronic absenteeism. So students that 
missed 10% or more of a given school year. And it's, it's actually out of uh, Todd Rogers out of um, Harvard helped to co co-found the organization and, and using behavior science to help to uh, inform families uh, of student of when their students are actually being um, chronically absent and uh, pushing out actually very strategic kind of mailers to families that are really like highlighting key things in a like proven way to help um, to help actually reduce that, uh, that chronic absenteeism. So they've done a number of random control trials and they could reduce chronic absenteeism by like 10 to 15% um, in big districts just by simply sending out information in a way that is uh, backed by behavior science and things like that. So there's an application of a lot of things that are coming, um, coming together in education that I think is really, really interesting uh, because in the past, I mean, education has been pretty siloed like I would say many years behind other industries as far as adopting technology, but it's just starting to, uh, to really try to get some momentum and pull from other areas and look, you know, look to other disciplines and other uh, practices that have been proven out maybe in other industries and start to apply them in, in new ways. So it's pretty interesting. And I like seeing that, I mean, when, with your example of, of the school, the school bus routes and, you know, going back to this central thought of as a parent, you're just, you're thinking about the student, you're thinking about the student 360, you, you, and you're thinking about the teachers as well. You want the teachers to not be working, you know, 12, 14 hours. You want them to be comfortable. You want them to have small class sizes. You want them to be emotionally and um, physically safe and uh, not fatigued. And there's all these different problems or challenges, if you want to call that, that we could tackle that aside from just giving the student a, a piece of equipment. Um, one of the, on episode 32 of this podcast, I, inter I interviewed Brig Lamro and Brig, he's a, a solution architect at Microsoft. I work with quite a bit. He did some data science for Apollo education when he worked there. And essentially his work was, can we predict the likelihood of a, a student dropping a class based upon certain behavior? And that was just a very, very small problem set. But there's so much more to the school system that you could be solving against to help the situation in terms of how to how we're educating these children that I think people need to just focus a lot more on. And I, I think towards the end of the, the discussion, I think you have some great ideas in terms of how we can start unlocking that technology and some of those strategies. But you know, I'm really focused on and I'm really interested in low income education, low income student populations. I think we talked about the proximity of uh, a family being in poverty to whether or not they're uh, retaining free or reduced lunches or they're in the program. Um, there's a lot of data around just looking quickly at the National Center for Children in Poverty. Going back to your, your point where 82% of children whose parents do not have a high school degree live in low income families. So there, you have a lot of correlation with parental education, family income, and the capabilities of the student based upon how they're educated. Um, the United Negro College Fund, they had a, a quick study and they said when students are not adequately prepared for K through 12 level, they need more remedial or developmental courses in college, which encourages dropouts and encourages extra student debt. So a lot of issues behind this low income problem. What are some things that you've seen work and not work? Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, to go um, just from, just to zoom all the way back up, if you think of my organization, Charter School Growth Fund, um, in the schools that we've helped to support, it's about a half, 400,000 or close to half a million students that are, um, that are attending schools that we've helped to support. Um, I think over 90% uh, identify as students of color or the students that are within the global majority. Um, and uh, uh, over 75% are eligible for free and reduced lunch. So the federal designation of being within a certain proximity to the poverty line. So, I mean, the, this is such a, such a nested um, systems pro uh, problem. And I want to just, going back to, you know, Intelligence, all these things are uh, 
distributed evenly, right? But opportunity is not, and there's and there's so many so many systematic things that are um, that are pulling on communities and families that uh, range from you know not access to employment, uh, you know funding uh, challenges uh, based off school funding formulas and systematic you know racism and uh, access to um, housing and and purchasing of housing and home values. Um, there's just so many things that that um, are embedded in the problem. So I think, I think, to my earlier point, the um, to think of school in isolation of all that is 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 uh, I think just inaccurate, right? Like there's there's so many other things to say. Oh, oh let's just look at school uh, um, in and of itself. Um, so I think that that's the first thing to really under, understand that. I think the second thing, um, based off all of that. I personally believe the flexibility to be able to adapt to what is the the needs of the families and the kiddos that you're serving that is like so critical. Um, and and from things like uh, can can we think differently about how we you know staff our school and and uh, how can we to my earlier point of of um, the one to thirty students in the class and how that's just really hard to meet students where they're at. Um, how can we get more adults in the class through some type of structured, like differentiated adult roles of if you're like, I have a lead teacher, a teaching aide, maybe some type of small group instructor to just have that smaller, smaller um, group size of students that you're really being able to focus on, on what those students need. Um, you know, how are you able to bring in, you know, community partners from, uh, from outside of the school to help with some of those wraparound like support services that, are really honoring the fact that school is not an isolation. There's uh, so many other things that are impacting uh, students' lives that um, when they come to school. So I think there's there's a number of different things, uh, and um, I personally will um, put it really in the category. And this is kind of how I look to evaluate new schools that I support. Is okay. How what is the urgency of the leader and team to be very intentional about the problem that they're going to solve um, and how are they designing the model, leveraging the flexibility of, of the charter governance structure to solve that. So, um, I mean, that varies widely of how people tackle that, but, um, but across, yeah, across our portfolio, you see most of our schools are in the top, you know, 25% if you compare them to similar schools of different um, uh, similar schools of the same kind of student demographics. They're, you know, in the top 25% if you look at, you know, math and, and reading scores. So uh, it is working, uh, but uh, there is no silver bullet um, to solve it. And so we, we talk a lot about this, the funding mechanisms, the incentives for education, you know, just doing some research before this talk, it was pretty, it wasn't that easy to find a lot of white papers on educate, you know, technology and education. It seemed like it was condensed into specific pillars that I could find. I'm wondering, you know, we've talked about this a little bit, but there is a big challenge with getting a Zoom or a startup to come in, a, a, a company that could potentially unicorn or a company that could really 100x their value how do you get that type of education focus? How do you get that type of entrepreneur? How do you get that type of team or inventor to focus on education first instead of going into the broad market? And you had some thoughts of where it really started with the funding mechanisms and the foundation for how these things are built. Can you talk about what that means for the future, some ideas that you have, what you're thinking about and how you're, you're looking to levy that into what you're doing in real time? Yeah, no, I mean, I think it's a, it's really interesting because when, um, again, as we're focusing kind of on the technology component of, of schools here, the, uh, when you think of new technologies, again, I'll put them in very broad buckets, but there's stuff that's like internally developed in schools, like these entrepreneurs or intrapreneurs that are developing technologies. And, um, and many times those are being shared out um, just kind of open source. Like we see that a lot across all the schools that we support across the portfolio of, um, of charter schools. They just kind of share it free. Um, so there's like, that's one area where technology innovation is happening. The other area is on the private sector. 
which are you know traditionally for-profit companies that are helping to produce technologies to solve critical problems like in school. The challenge with um, what I'm seeing in the markets now uh, and in the private capital markets is that if you are creating a a for-profit tech company that is you know focused on selling to K-12 school districts, it's not going to be super interesting to a traditional venture capital firm. So there's really like a gap in the market because if you think of like venture math, they're um, they're like okay, we need to probably two two big like um, things of venture math. You need to one um, start to realize returns in let's say three to five years, whether on paper or actually through some type of exit. Um, two, the math works at you know ninety seven percent of all your of all your financial returns are going to come from like one percent of your investments. So. You're like, go big or go home. I'm going to support these these um, companies. And if they can 100x plus, that's great. If they can't and they burn out, that's fine. As long as one of them does, it returns to the fund. So that's like fundamentally in opposition to having like really creating technology solutions that are actually helping to solve some of these these challenges. So if you if you think of the the pace of K12 and just sales cycles and 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 how to really kind of prove out that your technology is viable, you're not going to be having you know 100% growth year over year if you're selling into um, districts. It's going to be a little s- slower than that. Um, so so what that means is that venture funds are like, yeah, this is kind of interesting. I see the value, but I kind of want to sell to consumer, or I want to go international, or I want to go workforce development and put a lot of money there, just because like. I feel like the they've kind of seen a little bit of a dead zone of like the K-12 space because they're like, I just can't, you know, my job is to return the fund. I need to be a fiduciary of my capital. I can't do it making these bets. The other thing is that um, on the, um, the idea of, you know, 1% of the companies returning all the fund that, that by definition means that there would be a number of pretty awesome um, technology solutions that would be really helping kiddos and schools that are killed because they just couldn't grow, you know, fast enough or push to, you know, essentially close down. So you're like, Hey, if, if I make 50 bets and you know, one of them or two of them is really successful. Yeah. That might be successful from a financial standpoint, but from an impact standpoint, what about all those other things that were like actually really helpful and, and chipping away at some of these like structural problems um, with, uh, with just K-12 education. So I think there's a big gap in, private markets to just fully support the, uh, you know, 56 million students that attend, you know, public school. Uh, so there's a kind of like an innovation funding gap that um, has then been a lot of times been trying to be filled by schools that are the entrepreneurs that are trying to create their own technology solutions. But, um, but that can only go so far, you know, to get funded through philanthropy and other things. So I think, I think there's a gap. I think there's an opportunity uh, for someone to really take a long-term approach have some patient, you know, kind of capital with it just to, just to really um, help to solve the problem. And, and I know they're, they're coming up on time. We have four minutes left, but what are your thoughts on how education is going to be handled coming up here in the fall? Yeah. I mean, it's, it is a question. So I'll first say there, this is all live, right? Like people don't have any, um, we don't have the solution yet, but I think the um, uh, a couple of things that we know is that uh, one is that at home, some version of at home or remote learning is going to be necessary in whatever the situation is. Because if, we, if you think there might be a couple of different scenarios, um, you might have schools that don't open at all. So it's 100% at home learning. You might have schools that do open. But um, essentially, due to health and safety um, concerns to keep all the kids safe, given the pandemic, you need to do some staggering of schedules. You might do like an A schedule, a B schedule, a morning, afternoon, or something to keep um, students um, in smaller kind of cohorts that they have exposure to to just limit that. So you're going to have to have essentially for half of your students some type of at home learning or remote learning. Um, program. And then maybe the third is everyone comes back, you know, in a a normal way. Uh, So I think, um, and even if everyone comes back in a normal way, there might be rolling closures where everyone comes back and then there might be some outbreaks. You got to close the school for a couple months. So that whole, that, that back uh, kind of like foundation of what is this at home learning 
is going to be critical for um, for schools to be able to successfully serve students and to be able to toggle between in person and at home with as little friction as possible. So if we know that that has to be in place. We also know that across the country, access to reliable internet and devices is is really challenging for many people. We used to call it the homework gap because people would go home and it'd be challenging for them to maybe access online materials to do homework. But now it legitimately is like the learning gap. Like I don't, I just can't access, um, you know, can't access my school because I'm for the days I'm supposed to be home, I can't do it. Um, uh, Boston Consulting Group and the Walton Family Foundation recently put out a paper that uh, said about 30% of students either don't have access to um, to reliable internet or don't have devices. So we're talking about like 15, 16 million students that are um, not going to be able to engage in school in, uh, you know, in the way that, that we need. So I think um, there's a lot of stuff to figure out. I think there's a lot of questions on uh, learning loss for students when um, there's many kiddos who due to a lot of other circumstances, uh, we're essentially just not just stop school in March and have been not in, in school and not learning until, you know, this upcoming fall when they return, there's going to be a lot of, uh, you know, learning loss associated with that, where we have to catch students up. Uh, if you think of all the other like trauma and other things that, that families, if you think of the pandemic has predominantly hit, uh, you know, black and Latinx communities very hard. Um, if you look at the jobless uh, rates that are from from the outfall of this, uh, also hit same community super hard. So if you're thinking about, okay, you're coming back to school, uh, you might have a lot of like, you know, you might have experienced loss in many ways through the pandemic. You might have experienced loss from economic like insecurity and all these other things. It's it's not a, uh, not an easy thing to to solve. So all that said, we have a lot of folks that are thinking about this really hard and have great plans, but I think it's going to be a, um, it's going to be uh, uh, something where the flexibility that I've been talking about is going to be really important where folks are say, here's a plan. Let's try to, you know, but let's try to execute it. But um, I think things are, uh, things are going to have to be flexible uh, when we come uh, this fall, just to adapt to the changing environment of everything. Yeah. Yeah. Especially the, the communities that we're talking about, the low income communities where parents are working different schedules, um, folks that are, you know, have jobs that are a little more prestigious and could work from home and they have the tools to be at home with their kids and they can help them with technology and education. Whereas, you know, you have some lower income families or immigrant families that they're just not accessible. And there's, there's a, a gap in, in communication language. Um, but we're at the top of the hour. Just last thing I'd like to ask you is, do you have any advice for parents that are considering any kind of school, uh, any kind of organization, something, whether it be university or Montessori or daycare or, you know, K through 12, what's a, a line of advice for you? Yeah. I mean, um, when I just think about, I don't have kids. I know you, you have, you know, for your two kiddos that you're thinking about this, but I don't have kids yet, but I have been in schools a lot. So prior to the pandemic, I probably have, am in a school every week, uh, sometimes more than one school a week. So I think about this a lot. And really what it comes down to of how I would think about what I would want to evaluate a school for, for my child is just really thinking about how, how does this meet the needs of my child? Like every child is so different uh, between your two, you two, uh, you know, kids, I could imagine they're uh, not the same. They don't need the exact same stuff. You, uh, you know, the one school might be right for, for, for one and not the other. So just really thinking about what, what is uh, what will set up my child for success? Um, and um, and I think there's a number of ways to kind of like get at that. But for me, I I always love, if possible, visiting the school, chatting with the you know teachers, chatting with students, chatting with the principal, and just seeing what their experiences are. And like a, a big question I like to ask school leaders is just what is your um, what is your vision? for a graduate of your school, if it's elementary school, if it's a middle school or high school, it's like, what is a vision for your graduate? What, what is success for you? What do you want every graduate of here to have when they leave this school? And I think um, that kind of says a lot about the intentionality and urgency of how they're planning towards that vision. Um, and then um, you could kind of see as you're talking through that, you would say, oh, great, this is your vision for your school. 
where can I see that? What does that look like if this is elementary school? So when a fifth grader leaves, they have X, Y, and Z. What does that look like in third grade? Can you can you know can I see that or can I can I observe that? Where are you at? You know where are you at tracking towards your vision? So I think that to me and how that aligns with what you know about your child, that uh, that's the best way to um, that's that's one that's one of the ways I think about uh, doing it for my child. Um, embedded in that is the assumption that you have a choice of where you're sending your you know your child to school. So I think that's the other thing that we're um, you know, that we uh, had kind of danced around, but ultimately uh, choice is important because if you, uh, if you don't have that, then it doesn't really matter if you're, if your kids have different needs, they're going to go, you know, to the same, same place. So I think, I think that's uh, that's critical as well. If you had seven days and unlimited resources, Ian, how would you spend it? <laughs> um, I thought about this cause I know you asked uh, some of your other guests. Um, I would, I would create, some type of mentor program that um, incentivizes folks. I don't know what the economics would be. I'd have to think through it, but that you could have a mentor like throughout your whole life. And maybe that mentor changes because you need different guidance at different points. But um, I mean, I've experienced, and we started this whole conversation with like our experience with Kendra and MLT, like that mentorship helped to fundamentally change the trajectory of my life. And there are so many other points where folks have acted as mentors and helped me with that. So I think that is uh, that's just so important. And um, and if there was a way to create some type of, you know, marketplace matching or things that allow folks to do it and it and it's, uh, you know, incentivizes all parties, I think that would be an awesome organization to, to create. Well, thank you for your responses, Ian. I mean, it, 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 there's so many things that we could go down in this call and it's great just getting deep enough with you for you to overview all these different items because they're, they're all very close to my heart and yours and we're talking about kids we're talking about education in the future of our, this country and in the world essentially and, and just creating a better environment especially with some of the things that are going on i think education is a is a critical pathway to get into a better place so is there a good way for folks to get a hold of you uh, LinkedIn is the best. I'm pretty responsive on there. So if you send me a message, I will try to get back as soon as I can. But I basically accept everyone on LinkedIn. I think it's great to have a large network. Um, so I think that's the easiest way. And that's just Ian Connell um, on LinkedIn. And uh, and yeah, happy to connect with folks and continue the conversation. All right. Hey, well, hey, thanks a lot for joining, Ian. This was really fun. And just looking forward to seeing more of your work. This is just incredible stuff. Thanks, man. Thanks for having me and uh, appreciate doing it round two. Uh, first time with technical challenges, but uh, this is this is great. Yeah. Yeah. All right. See you later, Ian. Thanks.